Info Hub recap. We look back at the past week's main issues. In our headlines, President Granger calls for non-discriminatory admissions to the regional law schools. The head of state also assures that the foundation is being set to eliminate inequalities in education and public services in the hinterland. CJIA runs successful tests of their new arrival terminal. Indigenous Heritage Month is launched. Government taking steps to ensure full compliance with CFATF recommendations before 2022 and 2019 budget consultations get underway. These stories and much more in this week's Info Hub recap. First, we tell you that President David Granger said the groundwork is being laid to ensure that inequalities in public education and access to public services between the hinterland and the rest of the country are eliminated. The president was speaking at the beginning of Indigenous Heritage Month observances. Seneca Thorne has the details. The head of state made the remarks at the Indigenous Heritage Month's celebrations launch at Sophia Exhibition Center on September 1. President David Granger said that the government and the newly elected NTC must work together towards ensuring a better quality of life for the Indigenous peoples. The newly elected Tushaus Council, under the chairmanship, on the new chairmanship, can expect the fullest cooperation from the Ministry of Indigenous Peoples Affairs and the central government. We are working for the common good, and we will cooperate with the National Toshows Council to make sure that the policies that we both embrace, the removal of inequalities, would be furthered during their tour, during their tenure of office. NTC Chairman Nicholas Federicks said that the organization is pleased with the government's response thus far. It is our humble call to open your doors to us, the National Socialist Council, as you have been doing, and we want to compliment you, the ministries, for accepting the Indigenous people's proposals. We would like to see more. There is always room for improvement. Minister of Indigenous Peoples Affairs Sidney Alicock said that his ministry is working with the villages to develop their village improvement plans in an effort to map development. These plans are the basis upon which we will develop our villages, seek and justify funding, and have knowledge of our true potential. But we have to stop talking about our potential and really put our hands to the wheels and have the development process realized. So far, 57 VIPs will be completed by the end of this year. But the work continues. Every village should equip themselves with their VIP. Indigenous Heritage Month activities continues with the annual cultural extravaganza on September 1 to 5 at the Heritage Village Sophia Exhibition Center. Dances, songs, food, craft and art exhibition will be on display. Also scheduled are the Heritage Games, a fundraising dinner and reflection on the life of Stephen Campbell. The Heritage Village celebration is scheduled for September 15 at Shulinap Village, South Rubununi, Region 9. Seneca Thorne, InfoHub. Our InfoHub team traveled to Karao Village in Region 7 to get us a glimpse of the Indigenous Heritage celebrations there at the weekend. Karao's Tushau Romeo Smith applauded his council for the event. He described the celebration as an opportunity to remember the old ways. You know, we, the younger generation, I say we are losing touch of our, the skills of our ancestors, the skills that they survived on for centuries, or we don't know how long, but for many, many years. You know, I believe while it's very good to adapt to this modern world and it is still important to understand the ways of our ancestors, you know, especially in these uncertain economic times. I hope that we, the younger generation, would take a step and try to learn these things so that it could be beneficial to us and that our culture wouldn't just die away and fade in the background.
to shout of neighboring Batavia or in Williams, and a number of residents also attended the celebration. As, as a sister village, we support Carol, and we, we are very happy at least to be here. I'm happy for the village, the village council from Carol, actually, to have us as a part of this celebration. The event featured displays of indigenous foods, drinks, crafts, and cultural wear. Region 7 Chairman Gordon Bradford, residents of neighboring Amerindian villages in Region 7 and other regions also attended the festivities. This year's Amerindian Heritage Month is being observed under the theme Proud of Our Indigenous Identity, Celebrating in Unity. Crystal Stahl for InfoHub. The Chedi Jagan International Airport successfully tested their new arrival terminal. Details from Alexis Rodney. The trials started on August 31st and ended on Saturday, September 1. On Saturday, Minister of Public Infrastructure David Patterson, who arrived via a Caribbean Airlines flight, was quite pleased with the developments so far. I actually timed it as a passenger. I mean, how long it, would, it took the, when we landed and how long it took me to clear customs. And I was out of customs in 11 minutes from when we landed to, um, to, to not customs, to immigration. So as a passenger, I do think that it was a better experience for me. So... I mean, hopefully when there's inclement weather and those things like that, I mean, I'll be even better. But I think it's a really good, a great step for the airport. According to Minister Patterson, the new arrival terminals should be officially opened on September 15. Work on the departure launch is scheduled for completion by year end. So it's a work in progress. I mean, we have to meet the Ministry of Culture, um, the Tourism Board and those places like that so that we can come up with a good motifs um, to, to, to decorate the place, not only here, in and outside, um, at the moment, we're also doing a roundabout down at, uh, um, below and a new road, access road. So it's continuous work, but I do anticipate that by the end of um, the year, close to the first quarter, everything will be finished. Minister Patterson promised that more improvements will be implemented even after 2020. On Friday, InfoHub spoke with a few passengers who were also pleased with the progress so far. Um, I feel like it's a very nice modern development to it. Uh, from the flooring to um, the way the ceiling is, it's pretty high. Uh, it gives a very nice environment for new foreigners to come into the country as well as existing uh, citizens. And um, it raises the morale, I guess, of uh, the individuals coming to Guyana. So I, I do see it as a positive sign. I am impressed. When I came off the flight today and I saw this, you know, before we actually land all the way and I saw this, I was thinking, what happened? What happened while I was away these couple of months? But it's beautiful. I'm very, very proud of what's happening. I'm, I'm very proud. I'm happy. Deputy Chief Executive Officer of CJIA, Andrew Kelman, said that the purpose of the exercise was to fine-tune areas which could be deemed problematic. Kelman said the tests are being conducted on the entire operational process, including the immigration and the customs sections, to determine the equipment's effectiveness and the ease of operation. Reporting for InfoHub, Alexis Rodney. The free government school buses continue to provide a critical service to students and ease the pockets of parents. InfoHub's Isaiah Braffitt rode along with students of Region 3 as they journeyed from Hoop to Wales on their first day back for the new school term and filed this report. Students from various schools across Region 3 were in good spirits and excited to start their first day of school. Many of them rode the David G. school bus to get to classes. InfoHub spoke with some of the students from Potential Secondary. Well, I'm feeling nervous because this is the first time I meet at school. I feel a little excited because I'm going into a new class. I expect it to be exciting yeah. and educational. Learn more, study more, work harder. Driver of the David G. School Bus, Robert Williams, said he was happy to ensure students get to school safely. Picking these kids up is one of the best thing, you know, most thing that I like doing, you know, picking them, taking them to school. I just get a good feelings because I like taking these kids to school, you know what I'm saying? You know, they, they're nice kids, you know, so I enjoy taking them to school. Schools countrywide open today for both public and private institutions. Isaiah Brafitt for InfoHub. Now for more news, electricity supply on the Essequibo coast has been restored to normalcy as Anri China's new power plant is almost completed. Details in this Renata LaFleur report. The Anri China power plant is now 75% complete. The project's engineer, Hugh Peru, 
told Infohub that there was a delay in the equipment's delivery and some issues with contractors meeting deadlines. Nevertheless, he is confident that the project will be commissioned by mid-December as scheduled. We have um, our three um, manned diesel engines. They are placed on site already with all the auxiliaries. Uh, what is left to be done is um, connecting of the auxiliaries to the um, main engines um, and the electrical work which will comprise of um, installation of the switch gears and so on um, in the building. The new Anna Regina power plant will be the first in the country. The power plant will utilize heavy fuel oil, which is more economical for operations. Peru said Esequibians can look forward to a continuous and reliable supply of electricity. This new power plant is unique in the sense that it is um, a containerized base load um, facility. Uh, we are accustomed to have to having um, these facilities where the engines are in an open um, um, power station setting where all the engines are um, in one um, engine room. But this one, as you can see, we are having three containerized units. The new Anna Regina power plant will replace the older system which was used for decades. Renette LaFleur for InfoHub. Community health services will get another boost as 36 medics start a two-year training course. Public Health Minister Valda Lawrence is optimistic that the medics training program will do justice to the vision of achieving equitable health care. This program prepares mid-level health care professionals who are critical to ensuring that quality health care services is delivered in communities. Why am I so optimistic in spite of the myriad of challenges that beset the healthcare system in our country. Trainees, my optimism is built in you, each and every one of you, 36 of you, from your participation in this program. You have not been daunted by the unknown challenges of the next four years. If you were, you would not have been here this morning. The program's students are selected from the 10 administrative regions, especially far-flung and riverine hinterland areas. The Medics training program is a government-funded Associate of Science degree made possible through continuous collaborations between the Ministry of Public Health and the University of Guyana's Faculty of Health Sciences. Program coordinator Medics Sarah Daniels explains. The Medics program was pioneered by Dr. Richard Smith at the University of University of Seattle, Washington in 1969 and was further developed and refined at the School of Medicine and Public Health, University of Hawaii. The University of Hawaii facilitated the introduction of the program to Guyana when a team of health educators from the University of Hawaii and the Ministry of Health made the curriculum appropriate to suit the Guyana context. The medics training program has two entry pathways However, the enrolled students are part of the alternative pathway which lasts for 42 months. Students must attain a 60% pass mark in coursework and final exams for the first two years before moving on to complete the third and fourth year in the program. For InfoHub, Delicia Haynes. On Tuesday, Minister of State Joseph Harmon said the government's green paper outlines steps to be taken in the revamping of the sugar industry. The minister was addressing a one-day forum hosted by the Ghana Agricultural and General Workers Union, which was dubbed Sugar Too Big to Fail. With her report, here is Paul McAdam. That paper laid out the steps that were to be taken in this regard. Apart, as I said, apart from what Gao was put on the table, this document, there's nothing else coming from anybody else other than letters in the newspaper. Mr. Chairman, I want to posit that if we are to advance as a nation, we have to put our issues on the table and get it interrogated. We cannot await on a conference or whatever form of conference it is, or a letter to the news, letter to the editor, to put our issues there. The senior minister reiterated that sugar is not something being taken lightly, whether it be the workers' welfare or otherwise. He noted the sugar union's aggressive representation at high-level meetings. Consultation has always been the bedrock 
of what we do as a government. And so, Mr. Chairman, in addition to these consultations, and arising out of some of the, the foundations of the state paper, a special purposes unit for sugar was established. The SPU established guidelines about potential investments, the use of sugar lands, the valuation of assets, and other issues going forward, the minister added. At the one-day seminar, union representatives, along with other invitees spanning government, the opposition, and the diplomatic corps and other stakeholders, reflected on the industry, its impact, and the future. At the end of 2016, four estates were closed to reduce the billions that consecutive governments poured into the industry. To date, redundant workers have been paid at least 50% of the severance due to them, whilst it is expected that the remaining payouts will be achieved by year-end. Paul McCallum for InfoHub. Renetta LaFleur now brings us an update on the recently completed rehabilitative works on the section of the Linden Latham Road between the Wiz Rock and Rockstone Junction. Let's take a look. The stretch, once rough and muddy during the rainy season, is now a paved laterite road. Region 10's engineer Steve Day said the $11.9 million project covered six kilometers of roadway. This was as a result of the road being very deteriorated and caused much discomfort for residents and commuters actually using the road. It started in late June and finished in July. Casarina Drive, Montgomery, Richmond Hill and Hospital Road, Wisma are the three urban road repair projects slated for Linden in 2018. Engineer Day. Only Casarina Drive has been completed and the contract is currently mobilizing for Hospital Road and Richmond Hill, Montgomery Oval. On Castorini Drive, we've had sectional repairs um, and this covered 1.2 km of road. Works on Montgomery, Richmond Hill and Hospital Road, Wisma are scheduled to start within two weeks' time. Renetta LaFleur for InfoHub. In observance of Rakshabandan, Sister Usha from the Brahma Kumaris movement paid a courtesy call on Prime Minister Moses Nagamutu and his wife on Monday, September 3, at the official residence of the Prime Minister Main Street. Prime Minister Nagamutu expressed appreciation to Sister Usha for her visit together with other sisters from the Brahma Kumaris Center in Guyana. He also relayed his commitment to public duty and service to humanity. Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs Basil Williams is assuring that the government is taking steps to ensure full compliance with the anti-money laundering recommendations before mutual evaluation in 2022. Stacey Carmichael has details. Guyana comes up for assessment by the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, CFATF, in 2022. Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs Basil Williams, Senior Counsel, said it is imperative that the supervisory bodies and reporting agencies operate with a high level of efficiency. We have had a national risk assessment from which we pull out an, um, an action plan. We've had um, a recent meeting, I think it was at Bank of Guyana, and... Um, so that the various representatives would have been able to explain how the plan is going in terms of execution. And we have until 2022. So you obviously you don't wait until then. This, this, round, this fourth round is even harsher than the third round. The fourth round, A.G. Williams described as being more resource intensive, hence the need to complete a lot of work before 2022. The registries are currently updating information on companies with an emphasis on beneficial ownership. They have to be fit and proper. We have to put them in order in terms of the information that they're supposed to have in relation to companies and other legal arrangements. So the whole emphasis on beneficial ownership, that is, the need to know who is the actual owner of, of legal um, arrangements and, and legal bodies. So there's a lot of work to be done. And of course, the question of um, effectiveness with the FIU, SOCU, the DPP, and our um, judiciary, the, 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 the need to generate suspicious transaction reports. These reports are analyzed by FIU and sent to SOCU. And the question of SOCU doing investigations that could transpose into prosecutions. 
The Attorney General pointed to the need for convictions as part of the CFATF requirements. He said thus far many other jurisdictions have failed in this regard. The Attorney General noted, however, that convictions are dependent on the court of law. For InfoHub, Stacey Carmichael. A total of $10 million in checks was presented to the organizers of the first Gaitai Expo. This comes as the Guyana Office for Investment, Ministry of Business and other stakeholders prepared to host the Business to Business Exposition this month end. Crystal Stahl tells us more. Minister of Business Dominic Gaskin, who witnessed the presentation of checks, was appreciative for the support for the event. Very early in the game you came on board and we were, uh, you know, without your sponsorship this event could not have been possible. We don't have seed capital to really um, pull off an event such as this. It is not a money-making event. We wanted to uh, deliver on its objectives in the first instance. Uh, once we have it fine-tuned and we get it right, then we can look at the financial sustainability of the event going forward. Minister Gaskin said the government anticipates the exposition becoming a signature event and benefiting export-ready businesses both locally and throughout the Caribbean. Uh, we intend to hold Gaitai on a more regular basis um, and we intend to continuously improve the outcome of the event. This is the inaugural event. Um, no one can predict the outcomes. We have um, a stated set of objectives which we um, intend to, to, to meet through this event. A platinum sponsor for the event is Ghana Telephone and Telegraph Chief Executive Officer Justin Ned. We were first to come on board because we believe that our country and our economy needs stuff like this to really highlight and showcase what businesses are doing. And at GTT, we're at the forefront of innovating and pioneering new ways of doing things. Event organizer Tamika Singh said the committee is still in the process of collecting funds from other sponsors. Over 50 exhibitors will showcase their products and services at Guyana's first ever business to business exposition on September 19 to 22 at the Marriott Hotel. Reporting for InfoHub, Crystal Stahl. 22 parents of special needs children from across the country on Wednesday benefited from a one-day support group workshop. Director of Disability and Rehabilitation Service attached to the Ministry of Public Health, Dr. Ariane Mangar, said the workshop targets mostly parents with children who have microcephaly. This is a condition in which the brain does not develop properly, resulting in an abnormal smallness of the head. And it consists mainly of mothers who would have had... Um, Children with microcephaly, uh, I don't know if the public knows, but in Guyana here we had um, at least 20 children born with microcephaly. So it, this is a lifelong disability these children will go through. So with that, we are um, trying to support the parents with that. The outcome is just to give them some support because having a, chi a disabled child is a hard task to cope with that every day you have to do everything for the, that child in a lot of in a lot of cases you know and that could be very frustrating and and, and hard on parents and not only financially but emotionally so today we're we're giving them the emotional support parents welcome the program explaining that it will assist them to cope and understand ways to better care for their children well i um have my friends he I explain my problem to him and he's telling me that there is a rehabilitation center in Georgetown and that we should come and that's it, we went there and now we're here. I expect that it's going to help us a great lot in coping with our child and bringing up like any other child. The workshop is trying with the child, we're doing the best with him, with the girl, but um, for me like nothing really, not changing. Because it's one time a week I care in her, but I just try to do the same therapies home, like exercise or rub her up and stuff. The workshop is a collaborative effort between the Ministry of Public Health and the Guyana Physiotherapy Association in observance of World Physical Therapy Day. This will be observed on Saturday, September 8th. For InfoHub, Anarakan. Commuters can expect more efficient service with the recently rehabilitated vessel MB Sandaka back on the waters. The vessel, recently outfitted with two new engines, also underwent other rehabilitation works at a cost of $304 million. On September 5, a test run of the vessel was carried out by General Manager of the Transport and Harvest Department, Marceline Merchant, along with her team. 
Merchant was impressed. The trial run was done and it was successful. So we're thinking to have the vessel back into operation by this weekend, which might be Saturday or Sunday. The vessel is better equipped now to serve the residents at Leguan and other commuters who will be traveling between Perico and Leguan. Chief Mechanical Engineer Duane Griffith expects that a much improved service will be provided to the public. We are making, we are making good time. We are making good time. The tide, the tide is a bit calm here, but notwithstanding, um, I think we'll be able to cut down the travel time between Porico and Leguan. Leguan by at least at least 10 minutes, I would like to say. So um, previously, the travel time was approximately 45 minutes, and I think we'll be able to better that. The Transport and Harbors Department also plans to start the rehabilitation of the Leguan Ferry Terminal before the end of this year. Isaiah Brafitt for InfoHub. The Education Ministry and the Ghana Teachers Union agreed to go to arbitration after a meeting on Thursday afternoon at the Department of Labor. The two sides met today at the Ministry of Social Protection's Department of Labor, where they signed the terms of resumption. Today's arbitration move brings an immediate end to the GTU's industrial action, which lasted four days into the new school term. GTU President Mark Light. Immediately we have signed on to terms of resumption that the union will be calling the strike off with immediate effect for those teachers who can resume duty tomorrow. But we are sure that full resumption will be on Monday. Right? On Monday, all teachers will be returning to work, but those who can for tomorrow will be returning tomorrow. A terms of resumption signed between the two bodies states that the union will ensure that there is full resumption of work at all schools from Monday, September 10. 24 hours after the full resumption of duties by teachers, the GTU and the ministry will meet to determine the terms of reference for the arbitration panel as guidance to the Memorandum of Understanding between the GTU and the Education Ministry. The terms of resumption also states that there will be no victimization on either side, there will be no loss of pay or seniority, and that the status quo will prevail. The Guyana Teachers Union had proposed a 40% increase in salary for 2016, 45% in 2017, 50% in 2018, 50% in 2019, and 50% in 2020. These were to be granted to all categories of teachers for the years 2016 through 2020. However, the Education Ministry's counterproposal had made available a $700 million to facilitate salary increases for all teachers based on the current salary scale and the previously proposed $200 million for debunching for 2018. Unlike conciliation, arbitration is an alternative dispute resolution where an independent third party will decide on the issue. Reporting for InfoHub, Alexis Rodney. On Friday, President David Granger said the Council for Legal Education should seek new ways of improving access to and delivering affordable legal education to all corners of the Caribbean. Details from Alexis Rodney. Addressing the opening of the 50th meeting of the Council of Legal Education at the Marriott Hotel this morning, President Granger called on the CLE to ensure non-discriminatory admissions to the regional law schools. Ghana's need for a greater number of trained legal practitioners cannot be satisfied by the present quotas imposed on our students by regional law schools. Ghana looks forward to the Council of Legal Education to facilitate the education of more specialized legal practitioners in the Caribbean and of course in Guyana itself. Currently, Guyana is allowed a quota of only 25 students to pursue studies at the Hugh Wooding Law School. That number is said to be affecting Guyanese in this regard. Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs Marcel Williams weighed in on the matter, noting that each year Guyanese law students are faced with an enormous financial burden with fees of 98,000 Trinidad and Tobago dollars. The Attorney General said these fees are unaffordable. Our students simply cannot afford this high cost and therefore are deterred from a legal career. As Attorney General, I have received many calls and visits from students who have excelled in, at the undergraduate level, but because of costs, cannot complete a legal education. The Attorney General said although the government assists with 25% of the cost, the remainder is still a hurdle. This is the fifth time the CLE meetings are being hosted by Guyana. 
The meetings were held here back in 1975, 1981, 1987, and 1994. Reporting for InfoHub, Alexis Rodney. And finally, as preparations for the 2019 national budget got underway, the Commission for the Elderly submitted its proposals to Minister within the Finance Ministry, Jaipal Sharma, on the second day of budget 2019 consultations. Here are details. Minister Sharma welcomed the Commission's participation and commended the organization for submitting a written list of proposals to facilitate the consultative process. Minister Sharma said that the Commission is very respected by the Ministry given its national role. As the elderly population group, you must provide for them. And so we gave you this opportunity here today to say to us, what is your, what is your indication for the government of Guyana to focus in relation to elderly in budget 2019. What are some of the areas you would like us to address that you believe elderlies, the elderly population is lacking and how we could assist in budget 19, budget 2019 to make their, their lives better. The junior minister discussed the proposals submitted, including increased funding, a permanent office, regularization of the new Dawn elderly clubs, meals for pensioners, and more. Chairperson of the Commission, Everett de Leon, felt optimistic at the conclusion of the consultation. Especially with reference to the new Dawn clubs, yes, and the breakfast for the persons at the two post offices. Well, one of the main challenges is that we don't have an office where we can be able to, to reach, to plan and to execute our plans, and also to have persons, the elderly, um, come to us and to express themselves um, as to what are their challenges and how we can help them. We don't really have a place um, and I think that is of paramount importance. The National Commission for the Elderly is proposing a budgetary increase from $2 million to $5.8 million for 2019. This sum will enable the body to better execute its mandate of ensuring the nation's elderly are properly cared for and acceptable standards are maintained within the elderly care homes. Budget consultations began on September 6 with representatives of the THAG, GTUC and FETUG. They continued with the National Commission for the Elderly, GPSU and women's organizations on September 7. Consultations continue on September 10 with the PSC, and the GMSA at the Finance Ministry. Reporting for InfoHub, Alexis Rodney. You have been watching InfoHub Recap, where we share the past week's top stories. Goodbye.